Uh, good morning, all, and thank you for attending. Uh, I'm Larry Jewell from Edmonton Bright Seniors Group, and uh, this is our weekly um, Aging with Pride discussion group for GLBTQ to, uh, 2S plus seniors and allies. Uh, thank you as well for our partners, uh, or to our partners, SAGE and Pride Center of Edmonton. Our, our regular technical support, uh, it, um, um, Kim is not able to be here and he's being replaced by uh, no less than the executive director and Don Carter for which I thank, thank her, her. Don, however, does not uh, use sign language and therefore we will not have uh, signing today, but um, everything else will be the same as earlier. Before I introduce the speaker, I, I want to acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the history, um, uh, languages and cultures of uh, First Nations, uh, uh, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our community. Further, I, I would let you know that this session is be, will be recorded for future use in, the, in a uh, YouTube channel. So if you don't wish your image to be recorded, simply uh, close your video link. And let me reiterate that today's session in Kim's absence will not be signed. Our speaker is storyteller Ron Byers, who's a long-standing member and indeed leader in the, uh, the Edmonton queer community. He is the founder of uh, Rainbow Story Hub, uh, Edmonton Queer History Program, and his talk will be about local queer history clubs and I suspect something about Ron himself. So we're delighted to have you, Ron, and over to you. Thanks, Larry. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I was born in 1954 and raised in Edmonton, um, except for two years that I spent in Calgary from 1960 to 62. Boo. Um, I also lived on a small uh, farm out in, uh, west of Towfield, uh, but we'll talk about, about that a little bit more later. My ancestors were settlers arriving in Edmonton from Ontario in 1890. Uh, they rented land uh, from a man named Trimble in what is now known as Ritchie, just a short distance from the original Gainer's packing plant on Mill Creek Ravine. Then they went and bought land at uh, the Clover Bar, which is just uh, east of Sherwood Park. And uh, it was farmed, uh, that land was farmed right, uh, right up until 1970 by my great uncle. Um, I discovered my sexuality when I was about 13 and in grade eight at Stratford Junior High in the West End or rather someone who became my best friend during the years from 1967 to about 73, discovered it for me. Uh, we were both students at Stratford and in band class at the time. We had heard about, uh, we had heard about the Cosmopolitan Club's concert band junior program and decided to, to participate in it. Um, he'd already figured out he preferred men and it seems his gaydar was working just fine when he befriended me. Um, my friend introduced me to the nightlife at the time by encouraging me to sneak out my bedroom basement window to go downtown. We hung out at places like the Pig and Whistle restaurant and Jack's Grill until the wee hours of the morning, Don, slide. Thank you. And, uh, um, and then we would make the long walk back to our homes after the bus service was, was done uh, out in West uh, Laurier Heights, just west of the zoo. Uh, it, it was downtown where, where we met the first trans folks. Um, they, they, uh, they were mostly supported, uh, supported themselves through their work as prostitutes. And in fact, the police at the time uh, would sit up on the uh, second floor of the Seven Seas restaurant across the road from the Peg and Whistle uh, and, uh, and take pictures of the street workers and then occasionally swoop in and just arrest them all. Uh, that went, and that was quite a scene. In the picture that you've got on your screen right now, the top one shows the Pig and Whistle restaurant um, down in the bottom left of the, of the picture. And then just above it, you can see A&P Cafe. That later became Jack's Grill. And then further up towards the top, you can barely see the Lido sign uh, at a tilt there. That uh, eventually became the Olympic Grill, which became kind of a, a cruising spot as well. 
uh, and now today is known as the Rocky Mountain Brew House. Of course, the Seven Seas is now long gone. Um, and and uh, next slide. Uh, we would uh, we'd also walk down Jasper Avenue to 100th Street and then down to what was known as McDonald Drive, a strip of road from the Edmonton Club to, uh, to McDougal United Church that we all called the hill. And we would watch as the twink hungry men circled around the car in their cars looking for hookups. This picture was taken in the uh, very early 60s, I believe it was before AGT Tower was built. You can see the Edmonton Club just across from the McDonald Hotel on the right side of your screen. And then McDonald Drive uh, surrounded by the trees going over to McDougal uh, United Church on the uh, McDougal Church on the, on the left side of your screen there. Um, after high school, my best friend and I then moved into what was known as the Avid Arms Apartments downtown. Uh, but at the time, it was also better known as Vaseline Towers um, by the many gay men that, uh, that resided there at the time. You can end the presentation, uh, Don. Uh, in 1974, my friend and I choose different paths in life with him moving to Vancouver, where he founded the Vancouver Gay Men's Choir, which he still conducts to this day. Uh, Willie Zwazdeski also had an older brother named Gene, who became uh, a bit of a political force in Alberta politics. But before he left Edmonton, him and I decided to go out to this gay bar that some of the folks at the Pig and on the Hill had talked about. At the time, I was working for Malabar Dance and Theatre as the manager, and it was located right where Rocky Mountain Brew House is, uh, and, the, and had access to all the rental costumes. So on October 27th in 1973, we went to the Club 70 for the first time, dressed in Victorian Lord and Lady costumes. Uh, where, and when we got to the door, we had to prove that we were gay. Now, the reason we waited until 1973 was because Willie was one year younger than I was and had just turned 18 the month before. So if you go back to the beginning and, and I was in grade eight, he would have been a year younger than me at that time. So we were both pretty young. So that began my gay and lesbian uh, journey in the gay and lesbian community, which rapidly saw me become somewhat prominent by being elected to the board of Club 70 as the entertainment director in 1974. And the following 47 years were filled with many memorable moments and stories, including partying with Pike and Tina Turner in 1975, while I was traveling on the road with a drag troupe playing in public lounges and taverns across Canada. We met Eartha Kitt at the McDonald Hotel. We snorted coke with Canadian singer Jean Hippanelli, hosted parties on my farm out at Toefield with as many as 300 people coming out to have fun on a long weekend in July. Uh, of 1982, I believe it was. And I was working at Flashback as a business manager and I was part of the founding group of the Imperial Sovereign Corps of the Wild Rose and so much more. <clears throat> so how did I become a queer historian? Well, for many years, I loved telling some of the stories I had lived, um, but it wasn't until the last few years when it seemed every time I ran into Murray Billet that uh, he always talked about the need for some of our stories being recorded so they didn't get lost to time. Don, next slide. Did I lose Don? There we go. <laughs> and then in October 2019, Murray, Michael Fair, and myself were invited to speak at the LGBTQ, about the LGBTQ history, the dragging youth group at the Unitarian Church of Edmonton that, that uh, the thought of trying to find a way to get some of our history recorded um, sort of became important to me. And in uh, January, 2020, the recently hired curator, Christine Hardy, for a project of the Edmonton Heritage Council called the Edmonton City as Museum Project, put out a call in one of the Facebook history groups looking for someone to write a story on the local LGBTQ plus groups. Uh, Don, next slide. The Imperial, uh, and you can go to the next slide as well. The Imperial Sovereign Court of the Wild Rose was one of the groups that they wanted to have uh, his, no, back one, uh, history on. Uh, there we go. And uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Lauren Stelmack, otherwise known as Big Daddy, uh, tagged me in a recommendation to tell the story. And that sort of began my recent push to, to document our community's history. So in addition to uh, submitting an expression of interest in writing about the first uh, 20 years of EIS and WR with Rob Rowatsky, 
offering to write the next 20. I also submitted story ideas for the history of gay bars in Edmonton. Also, coming out gay in Edmonton, which would have focused on the late 60s and early 70s. Also, a story about John Kerr, which was later written by Darren Hogan this past uh, spring, and the 80s and 90s AIDS crisis in Edmonton. Uh, Ecamp thought that was probably a bit much <laughs> for me to, to, to do all that writing. Uh, but they did add, approve adding the history of gay bars in Edmonton to the history of, of the ISCWR part one, uh, which was good. I, I mean, the stories were only supposed to be about 1500 words a piece. So I immediately saw this uh, as an opportunity uh, to, to put my dream of documenting our stories into a reality. So in February of 2020, I started what became known as uh, the, the Edmonton Queer History Story Portal. Uh, soon after, I invited my dear friend Rob Rowatsky to be a collaborating partner with this new program, uh, since we were both going to be working together to write the history of the ISCWR. Our two-part story was scheduled for publication in October of that last of, of last year. My story on the history of gay bars in Edmonton was scheduled for September, and I realized that even though my memory was pretty good, I, re I really needed the help of a published author, author to pull it off. And since Rob was bored, as the bar he was managing co-owner of, Evolution Wonderlands, was closed due to the pandemic, I asked if, I, if he wanted to work on this story as well with me. So we started the research and compiling the list of gay bars that had existed. Uh, as the list grew, we quickly realized that we could not possibly tell a story in the 1500 words that Ecamp had allotted us. So we asked for a bit more. And Christina Hardy, recognizing the importance of the story, graciously agreed to let us um, tell, tell the story in two or three parts of 1,500 words each, or a total of uh, 4,500 words. Um, the the uh, next slide, um, Don. Um, in the end, it ended up becoming a six-part story with around uh, 7,200 words, and we're really thankful for ECAMP and the Edmonton Heritage Council for supporting the importance of this story in its entirety. Um, one of the e one, one so so what work is being done in the history of, of Edmonton? One is one is the ECAMP project, which started in 2014, and at the time it, uh, they had invited Michael Fair to write a story. Uh, he chose one memorable story, Flashback in the Gay Drag Races, and when that story was published, it kind of caught me off guard, as he chose a picture that had been taken one year at the annual May Long Weekend event, which I had hosted regularly. In the picture, I was standing there in my purple sequin gown with my best cowboy boots on. <laughs> there I am, front and center. Um, those boots, by the way, uh, and the, uh, um, the gloves, that I have on, which are, are leather gloves, and a pair of leather chaps that I had uh, were recently donated to the uh, Royal Alberta Museum and now form a part of their collection. Um, ECAMP moved slowly for a few years until Christina Hardy came on board and the project took on a, a new mandate, which wanted to include stories from contributors historically excluded from representations of Edmonton's past, such as the indigenous and racialized peoples and members of the LGBTQ2S plus community. Since then, they have published a collection of about 20 LGBTQ2S plus stories. But the first real publication of our history began almost 25 years ago uh, with Darren Hagen, who published his first book, The Edmonton Queen, Not a Riverboat Story in 1997. That was Darren's first book. That's actually a copy uh, of the one that I have here. Uh, I didn't take a copy of the picture inside, but it has a, 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 a lipstick print of his lips and, uh, and a personal signature to me. Um, it documented some of the history of the drag queens of flashback in the 80s and 90s, and even included a title, a chapter titled Somewhere in a Field Near Toe Field, which shares some of the outrageous activities that took place at my farm. Yes, yeah, somewhere in a few days. So Darren's, Darren's book, uh, in 2007, Darren was invited to update its book, and he published The Edmonton Queen, the final chapter, or the final voyage, uh, which is still available on Amazon in both hard copy and Kindle. Uh, this work was originally presented as a fringe festival play in 1996 and received a sterling award. 
um, good book. There, it's still available uh, and it's definitely worth the read. Next slide. Darren went on to document even more of the history in his plays, The Witch Hunt at the Strand, which was about the same sex trials of 1942 and The Empress and the Prime Minister presented at Theatre Network in 2019, telling the story of Vancouver Ted North and then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau and the conversations they had leading up to the decriminalization of homosexuality in 1969. And it was those, those conversations that, that uh, Ted and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau had, Ted really got uh, Prime Minister Trudeau to get, got him to get some insight into the gay community. And, uh, the conversations helped him in, in redefining the, the laws at that time. The last couple of years, Darren's been uh, researching and interviewing people to tell the full story behind the Pisces bathhouse raid in, in 1981 in a yet to be published work. Recently, I've had discussions with a Los Angeles actor and producer, no, uh, back, go ahead, yeah, uh, with a, a Los Angeles actor and producer, Troy Roptush. And he, he was born and raised in Vagraville. Um, and recently had a, had a film premiere, both in Bakerville and, and across Canada and the United States. It'll be available, it's available currently on uh, TELUS uh, and should be available on Netflix in the future. Um, and it's called They Who Surround Us. And it's about a, a, a Ukrainian farmer uh, in the Bakerville area who is his wife and some of the trial, trials and tribulations that he goes through. Um, um, Troy had, had reached out to us about uh, information on queer history and he was looking, because he was looking to produce an anthology series, which explored more on the same sex trials of 1942 in Edmonton, which Darren wrote about in Witch Hunt at the Strand. Uh, Roy recently posted this Instagram post uh, on October 20th, alluding to the project. And you see the hashtag deviant, hashtag true crime, hashtag true, true crime addict, hashtag anthology series, hashtag 1942 hashtag noir, hashtag detective, hashtag dragnet, and hashtag Edmonton. So it'll be interesting to see how this, uh, how this production works out. I don't know how many uh, episodes he's planning on producing, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's gonna have to do a lot of research as well into, uh, into those trials, which, which were quite famous at the time. They, they were uh, written about quite broadly uh, in the Edmonton Journal and, and uh, newspapers right across Canada. Uh, and basically what it was, it was a group of actors that had uh, uh, got gathered together in the Old Strand Theatre. Um, they were a, a small theatre group and they were all gay and uh, the police came, heard about it and came in and arrested all of them uh, for being gay. Uh, next slide, 2015, Dr. Chris Wells uh, created the Edmonton Queer History Project. Uh, and made a start at documenting some of our past. Um, he and uh, Michelle Lavoy curated a physical traveling exhibition of artifacts and pictures telling some of our history. Um, this past spring, they also uh, worked with Darren Hagen, Michael Fair, Rob Bowatsky, and, and others to restart their project. And they put together, a, I believe, a, a walking tour that you can download on your phone as an app and you can look forward to seeing this uh, at Pride of 2022. Next slide. This summer, my program, the Edmonton Queer History Story Portal finally got off the, the ground, long delayed by the pandemic. Um, with the community advising team, including Michael Fair, Darren Hagen, Liz Messiah, Anita Jensen, Marty Panas, Rob Gurney, myself, and Rob Lewatsky, we met virtually to develop a mandate and path forward to start collecting stories that tell our history from those who lived it before those stories get lost to time. Next slide. In discussions on how to move forward, we also came up with a new name to better identify and distinguish what we'll be about. And now identifying as the Rainbow Story Hub slash Edmonton Queer History. So far, we have published a few stories and, shares, and shared some done by Darren and Michael from other projects like ECAMP and the Edmonton Public Library. The reason we chose, we chose to keep with the Edmonton Queer History is because we can change that tagline and focus on specific projects. So we will still be the Rainbow Story Hub, 
but some projects could be the Edmonton trans history or the Edmonton lesbian history um, or the Edmonton bisexual history who often get left out of things. Next slide, since December 27th, we've been publishing a collection of videos from Edmonton Pride Parades from 2001 to 2014 from Rob, Rod McConnell. Uh, this came about from a message I got from Liz Messiah. We found an old CD, a note that's a CD, not a DVD, which had the 2001 Pride Parade on it. She thought it might be a good addition to our program and, uh, and the website. So I tracked down Rod and uh, to get his permission, and this led to him offering many more years that he had in this collection. Him and I have been working for the last two months to try and put them all together and get them uploaded to our YouTube channel and posted onto our website. So in just a, about uh, 40 minutes, uh, you can check out our, our next um, post on social media for the 2007 Pride Parade, which also features uh, a segment of Michael Fair's last Pride speech as a city councilor. Looking for more stories to fill out our history from the viewpoint of those who lived it. Each of us have had unique experiences, and that means there's so much room for so many stories that, taken as a collective, would give future generations a great picture of life in the 2SLGBTQ community in Edmonton. For those who've experienced the wonder and changes that Flashback brought, there are so many different stories we'd love to see. We feel that there's never too many stories about flashback, the roost, or events such as the Delrin Green case, pride festivals, and more. So how can you contribute if you've got a story? You can reach out to us through our website where you can submit your story idea. Next slide. And we'd love to hear about you and your story uh, or the telling of an event or person or place that was significant in your life. Just go to our website at aqueerhistory.ca slash contribute and you'll see this form on there you just fill it out and send it to us and there is also a link for the content uh, creator guidelines that you can download to see what sort of our uh, sort of expectations that we have uh, for an article um, which which generally would include some pictures or, or you know visual parts of it as well Next slide. So we recognize that not everyone is great at writing essays or stories. And then it's my hope that we can find some energized people to put together a program with Edmonton and area GSAs and QSAs to team up some of, our, of their participants with one of our community's heroes who have a story or need their story told. This vision is connecting someone from our community with some of these young folks to document the story and then tell it on their behalf. So if you think you want to be a part of this or, or want to take on the challenge of organizing this, we would love to hear from you. Uh, it's a lot of work to pull this together. There is a, a, a GSA uh, Alberta organization that is a good starting point to get out there and launch this. But it, it, for us, I mean, we, we know that not everybody's great at writing. I, I sometimes write too much. Other people write barely, barely enough. So, we think it's really vital that the important that, that the young people get a chance to to work with some of our elders in our community and get these stories down and this is such a great way of doing that uh, by putting the two groups together next slide this past june i was also contacted by the, the provincial museum of alberta who've expressed uh, sorry the royal alberta museum uh, who've expressed a, a serious desire to tell our community story in a new display, which will be curated for 2023. Now they've approached me and the Rainbow Story Hub to help make this happen. And we're looking for community members that are interested in working with them to create this display. We did a, a, a tour of the museum where several of the curators were, uh, walked through with us and sort of demonstrated in a visual way how they go about putting a story case together. Um, we looked at some of the showcases and they showed us how they put the items in there, how they document them, and then how that whole case still tells a whole story. Uh, so we, we want to be able to help work with them and try and develop this story. Uh, and the, they're looking at doing this for 2023 because apparently it takes a year or so to develop the idea and then another year to actually curate the items to, to put it into the display. Next slide. So where can you go to read some of our stories? 
Well, first is the Edmonton City is Museum Project at citymuseumedmonton.ca. If you'd use the search box and just search gay or search queer or search lesbian, uh, it'll come up with a list of the stories with that tag uh, reference to it. And you can go to our, our website at uh, yegqueerhistory.ca or onto our social media accounts, Yeg Queer History on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, we publish a lot of stuff that doesn't necessarily get onto our website. We publish on social media. But on the, on the website itself, we have uh, a number of stories, particularly in the parades right now, uh, plus links for stories that uh, Derek Hagen did for the, the uh, Edmonton Public Library, talking about the Pisces bathhouse raid, um, the uh, Michael Ferris story on ECAMP, plus a, a, a link for the ECAMP using the search term gay. Um, next slide. Now, the promotion for today's event suggested I'd be talking about gay bars in Edmonton. So here's a list of all 38 and the locations, with all 38 places and locations with some bars in several locations and some locations having several bars. When Rob and I set out to uh, write the story, Rob had already done some of the work in the previous few years, more for his own interest at the time. He would text me and, and say, do you remember a bar here or do you remember a bar there? And I'd say, well, yeah, I, I remember that. So it, most of that, list, that original list that he was putting together came from my memory, but we actually started to do the research. Neither of us expected to have a list this long. Um, so we're only open a couple of weeks and that would be, uh, uh, I don't know, the last one's actually gone. There's, there's a missed last one at the end past Mama's gin joint that isn't there, I can see it. Um, and that was only open for a period of three weeks in June of 20, 18, I believe. <laughs> um, and then the roost, which was at its only location for 30 years. And the stories on all of these are on the ECAMP website at cdmuseumedmonton.ca. Uh, there's six parts, five of them tell the stories of the bars, and the sixth is this list that you see on the screen before you. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the list. So if you've got any questions on any gay bar in Edmonton or anything to do with our history, then free, feel free to ask away. And thanks for listening to this presentation. Okay. Anyone got any questions? Thank you very much, Ron. I'll uh, ask people to unmute themselves as they have questions and you uh, may either uh, simply wave your your hand or use the the uh, chat uh, uh, box and we'll try to find anything. Ron, I'll maybe start with the first question. I came out in Edmonton in 1967. It wasn't noticed because of the centenary celebrations, I suppose. Uh, but <laughs> I, uh, uh, my strongest memory actually is not of the bars so much as the after bar parties and the way that really created a community. Do you have any similar experiences? You know, I, I didn't do it. I'm not a really social person. So I, I'm not always comfortable going to house parties, um, but certainly a lot, of, a lot of people around me and a lot of friends, uh, that whole house party scene was happened uh, you know, because there was really no no private clubs at the time, um, with Club Seventy only only opening up in late '69, early '70. Um, so people like uh, at, at the time would would go to all these house parties, and and uh, that's sort of how they socialized at the time. That that went on well into the late '70s, uh, and you know a little bit in the, in the early '80s. Um, but you know, as far as as far as uh, public bars at the time. Um, you know, they would people would gather at the, uh, you know, the local taverns and stuff like that, um, such as uh, you know the King Edward Hotel, um, King Ed. uh, Mayfair Hotel, the Corona Hotel, um, and there's another one that's escaping my mind right now, which is downtown around 101st Street. Yeah, I th uh, the the um, it, it certainly was a way of helping to create community and how central, of course, the gay, the, the gay bars were in that area to the, the creation of community. They had some downsides as well that we may talk about later, but, but a 
central institution. Michael has a uh, question or comment. <laughs> <you've been> <laughs> Thank, so, thanks, and, and thanks um, yeah. uh, very much, Ron, for, for the presentation. I do have a question. I'm just going to make a couple of real quick comments, uh, because um, what I was told about house parties um, is, is that that there were a number of um, house parties that, that um, lesbians had, on the, particularly on the south side, um, um, off of White Avenue a, a bit, but, but closer to uh, Bonnie Doon kind of thing in that area um and a number of men that were notorious for having them almost every weekend that that lived um in an apartment on 101st um uh and about 111th and it was raided by this, uh, the police a couple of times because of the noise and blah 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 kind of thing in that too i i don't have any detail on, on those I, it was just uh um uh, 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 interesting. I did want to ask, though, um, you indicated that you were on the <clears throat> the board of Club 70 in, and I think about 1974, I think you said. Yes. So, um, and and it, 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 the, the club lasted a couple more years after that, and, and that, and I wonder if you can say something about that. And then did, 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 um, um, did, 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 did um, uh, Boots and Saddle take over right away, or was there space in between that and that building? What do you remember? Uh, boots, uh, boots and Saddles, um, what, what happened was Club 70 was so restrictive in, in their door policies at the time. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, as I noted uh, in 1973, when my, my uh, friend and I went to their Club 70 for the first time, we had to literally prove that we were gay. Um, and, and, you know, at the beginning in 1974, the reason I was elected to the board is because I'd started working there part time and I occasionally worked on the door. Uh -huh. And I and I occasionally had to, you know, def ask people to prove they were gay. <laughs> uh, it, it was it was really, you know, it was kind of a bizarre situation. But at the time, I mean, you really had to make sure that who you were letting into the club, yeah. uh, you know, wasn't going to be a problem uh, coming in. Um, and but that created a, kind of a rift in the community, and, and in particular, some uh, some folks like John Reed and Pat Forche and uh, Paul Chisholm and a few others uh, got offended by. Uh, you know, uh, 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 by the policy, uh, they had uh, wanted to take a, a, a very lovely lady um, who was kind of a hen mother for a lot of the gay people, hung out at the King Edward Hotel in the tavern on a regular basis. Her husband had passed away. Uh, her name was Jean Lawson. Everybody Jean. called her Mother Jean. Mother Jean. And they had wanted to bring her to Club 70 because she, you know, was, was so enthralled with the gay boys that she kept around her all the time. And she was denied entry. And, and that just infuriated a lot of people. And, and that launched uh, Flashback. Uh, and the mandate of Flashback right from the very first day was that it would be for gay people and their friends. And that tagline and their friends was so important because they wanted to be able to, that, that gay people could have a place that they could take their buddy or their friend from work or you know a family member or whatever uh, and, and not get questioned at the door as to whether they were allowed in or not. Um, yeah, so it, it, that that caused Club 70, once Flashback opened up, that caused Club 70 to die down a bit. Um, and eventually they kind of decided to close. Um, a group of girls got together and opened it up as a lesbian bar called Cha Cha Palace in 1976. Uh. And then in 1977, they defaulted on their loan that they had taken out from a, uh, a loan officer for a, a loan company. Uh, his name was Conrad Dragoo. Uh, and uh, Conrad had been the officer of this company that he worked for that loaned him the money. And when he had to repossess the place, he decided to sink his own money into it. And Con uh, opened up what was called Boots and Saddle. Ah, ah, interesting. I suspect that um, Robert and I aren't the only two people who wondered about how exactly you proved that you were gay getting uh, through the, <laughs> the closed door. You don't have to answer, uh, but uh, it, it's an interesting policy. And, and you know, if, and you're right. I mean, how, how do you prove that you were gay? I mean, that, that was a bit of a challenge. Um, certainly it was, um, uh, you know, asking questions, you know, uh, and, and trying to figure out what the answers were. So, yes. Somebody asked uh, for the link for the list of gay bars. Uh, I put it into chat. 
Thank you for that. Yes, that was Blair's question. Uh, so I appreciate that. Michael, did you have another question or uh, your, your sign is still up? The only thing I, uh, I was just going to comment when you're talking about um, uh, hotels, it was the King Eddie was one of the downtown uh, places yes. that people went to late at night and in those early days, but that's all. Yeah, yeah, the King Eddie on 101st Street, uh, right where Manulife Place is now. Yeah, uh, that that was a favorite haunt. I remember going down there and and finding Millie and Mother Jean. And, yeah, uh, um, Trixie and uh, Jack and Two Step. And <laughs> you know, all, is, all the old queens were down there, surrounded by uh, with Mother Jean at the head of the table. King George is the other one who has a question that I'm missing and not seeing. Uh, um, uh, uh, Blair. Hey, Ron, I was I was amazed at the list of bars, how long it is, and I only knew a few of them. Um, you know, especially Boots, um, The Roost, and Flashback. What was it, what was the reason why so many of these bars didn't? I mean, look at the years. How many of them didn't last very long? A year or sometimes months. Uh, you know, it's, sometimes it was location, and sometimes it was the ownership. Um, the uh, um, Club Aquarius was was on White Avenue, and you know this this is one that that we I, we had to really I remember it because uh, a group I was with uh, at the time. Uh, no, that wasn't it. Club Aquarius. No, that was actually that was actually from a documents that we found at the Edmonton Archive. Um, that's number three on the list there, and and the archives had this this promo material for. Club Aquarius, and, and they were going to do a pre-launch party at another club called Pegasus Club. And the Pegasus Club was located on 106th Street, just north of Jasper Avenue, uh, right across the road from where Boston Pizza is. And the owner and operator of that club was a fellow named Pierre Cochard. Oh. Uh, if that name sounds familiar, that is Shea Pierre. <laughs> So in, in, he had opened uh, the Pegasus Club in 1970 and 1971. Um, and uh, in, in fact, the, the very first public drag show uh, in Edmonton was done at Chez Pierre or at Pierre Cochard's uh, Pegasus Club in 1971 uh, by Millie and Chatty, the first and second empress of Edmonton. Um, Flashback One just outgrew, outgrew the space that they were in. Uh, which is underneath Norman's restaurant, uh, where, where Norman's is now. Um, the Cha Cha Club was what the uh, the lesbian club was called after Club Seven or Club Seventy closed, and then Boots and Saddles. Uh, the Roost Night Club, of course, was in its one location the whole time. Um, and then Flashback Two opened up right across the road from where uh, the Roost was. Stepping Out was opened up by a couple of people on the corner of 109th Street in the Dorchester Building on the main floor. Uh, where that kind of rounded alcove is at the back of the building. Um, Mamas. Uh, so it, there's a number of them that were opened at 10148 105th Street. Now that is currently a, a gentleman's club right now, right across from the hotel. Uh, Mamas was the first there. She was the matriarch of a family of uh, Middle Eastern um, folks. They had opened up a nightclub and, and Again, the name is escaping me. I remember what it was, but it's gone in my mind right now. Uh, and but they it became quite a drug den, and the police uh, were there regularly raiding it and, and stuff like that. So it got closed down by the police, and and she just kind of took over the assets from her her sons that were running it, and tried to open it up as a gay bar. Uh, so that was the first time that location became a gay bar. Then it didn't last long. It went on, it was closed for a bit and then reopened as Reflections and then closed and then reopened as Lamborghinis. Uh, and then the option room one had a bit of a history to it in that it opened originally in a building on 110th Street, just north of the high level bridge there on the main floor. There'd been a, a nightclub, uh, nightclub uh, and lounge in there, uh, which was owned by the fellow that owns, um, Oh, I, I, I was in bad news, which is why I have to write this all down. <laughs> um, <laughs> the karaoke for uh, Rosario's, it's a Rosario's karaoke place that on 108th Avenue and 117th Street. Um, 
they they originally had their the first location was where this option room one was when triple five who owned the building found out that a gay bar had taken over the space in 1993 they locked the doors and that's the fact second time a landlord locked doors on a on a gay club in the city uh, they were taken to court by the guys that had the option room um, and that uh, they, they won uh, and the landlord was was told to give them back their space and their key and the keys and they refused to and, that, and that's the Grimazians. Um, they uh, they have since changed their mind on a lot of things. Triple um, Five and uh, West Hampton Mall now are a sponsor of the Rage LGBTQ uh, hockey team, uh, who regularly play on the West Hampton Mall ice arena. Um, and yeah, I mean, in a lot of cases, it was just you know locations didn't last or or uh, you know just the wrong owners and whatnot. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I was surprised at the length of the list as, as well. I saw someone asking uh, if the lesbians were welcomed at all of them. And, and in fact, some of them were actually lesbian bars, uh, such as Secrets uh, in both their locations. Prison Bar and Grill was a lesbian bar. Uh, and uh, uh, the Junction, which took over the Club 70 space after Boots closed, after Jim, uh, Jim Schaefer died, uh, the Junction was actually owned by a couple of lesbians who had owned Prison prior to it. So yes, lesbians were, were welcome at most of them, except for Club 70 in the beginning. But, and, you know, that changed fairly quickly because a couple of women were part of the board. Ron, if I, um, one of my memories in 1967, gosh, I would have loved that list uh, because um, in coming out, one of my really strong memories is of course, how difficult it was to find any information. And the way I found myself to, uh, found a gay bar in Edmonton was I happened to be in a straight bar in, in White Avenue, went to the men's room uh, and someone had written, where are the fags go in Edmonton? And wonderfully, someone had answered it. I was down to that other bar, which is actually Royal George on First Street the following night and never looked back. Uh, but it, it really was a time I, I moved fairly soon after coming out to Toronto and one of my memories in Toronto was at that point having gay bars on Young Street clearly identified and known to everyone uh, as such but it was it really was an era in which the bar was very central but you sort of you had Finding them was, for me at least, was tough. And, and uh, I don't know whether anyone else has any experiences they would like to recount about the first time they came into a gay bar or anything else, uh, Joan. Um, I, my first gay bar experience was in Hawaii. I was just recently divorced. So I went to Hawaii and uh, was thrilled to death. So came back. I was living in Camrose at the time and I heard of flashbacks. So I drove all the way to the city with my little map. I'd never, you know, driven by myself to the city and I got the flashbacks and I was wearing long skirts and cowboy boots and a bandana. It was like Katie Lang kind of thing going on. I don't know. And I stood there all night and nobody approached me except for hours later this one woman came up to me and asked me if I was a cop <laughs> that was the only interaction I had but after that it was great I, I think I probably looked scared out of my mind too but um after that I would go back regularly and I loved the place it was so fantastic yeah <laughs> in, in addition in addition to the the you know the prior to the bars opening up and the first one didn't actually open until 69 uh, and the the public taverns where people went like the Mayfair Hotel the King Eddie the King George uh, there was also other places where gay people met and that was the washrooms of the uh, Greyhound bus depot on 103rd street uh, there was also the washrooms there used to be a, a, a set of, of underground washrooms yeah. on Rice Howard Way oh, right. Uh, on 101st Street, and uh, it, was, it was right next to the Metropolitan store that was there at the time. Uh, people would go there, um, the, Woodward, the Woodward's washrooms in the Woodward's yeah. store. Um, May. It, I, I think, I think the Bay as well. The, the Bay as well, yes, yeah. 
yeah, that's right. And then, you know, Jack Squill and uh, the Pig and Whistle, I mean, those are those are mostly nighttime pickup spots. The Jasper Avenue between 105th and 106th Street was also kind of a cruising strip because in addition to the, the, uh, the trans uh, prostitutes working there, uh, there was also some of the, the cute gay boys like, like myself uh, that occasionally worked out on the street. Um, and, and people would drive around, you know, the block and, and pick up people there. Uh, and also on the hill and the the old coffee cup inn which was down on 96th street and jasper avenue other questions or uh, comments uh jan um i just had a comment on on how far people have come and i think it was um 2007 possibly 2008 when team edmonton had a fundraiser and it was in a first class motel on Calgary Trail. And we are all allowed to be there. We are all allowed to be out. We are all allowed to be dressed in nice, nice uh, outfits uh, while we participated in this um, fundraising, a gay fundraising event. And we, we chatted about in the past, how we always had to go into the back alleys, the CD places, the washrooms. And, you know, it, it really was a milestone when we could be out and about with regular society in nice places. I absolutely agree, uh, Joan. You. Um, what do you think about the future of gay bars, Ron? Do you think it's going to be a niche still or if it's like old, old fashioned now or what do you think? <laughs> That, that's a good question. I, I don't see Rob here, so <laughs> um, I can be probably a little bit more honest. I don't think there is going to be a, you know, a future for gay bars. Um, I think we have reached a point in, in our society at this point where the need to have that secluded location is no longer uh, as important as it had been in the past. Um, certainly, there are, there's a number of, of bars throughout the city now that, that gave people, uh, you know, frequent on a regular basis and, and hold drag shows on a regular basis. I mean, drag shows are no longer confined to the gay bars anymore. Um, now, all kinds of places are, are holding them. Um, so, you know, I, possibly there, there, you know, there may be a, a bit of a niche for, you know, a kind of a flashback type environment where it's for gay people and their friends. Uh, and that's pretty much what evolution is at this point in time. I mean, even, even looking at evolution now, there is so much about it that reminds me of flashback on 104th Street uh, and, and the mix of crowd that's in there. It's very much a, you know, a mix that, that, like it was back then. So, you know, I think there's a possibility that something like that might stay, uh, you know, for around for a while. Uh, it is possible that, that a pub uh, atmosphere operated by the right personality uh, might make a go of it um, because there's still a lot of people that would prefer, you know, particularly men would prefer to go to a bar where all they're going to have is, is other men who might be interested in working up with them. Um, but in the city, I mean, that, that the pubs, I mean, we really only have had one pub and that was Woody's, uh, it, you know, in, in that type of, of style. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it lasted for quite a few years, and but you know nobody else has been able, nobody else has ventured to to invest the money to open up another one similar to that. I think that really does reinforce how important it is to document this phase uh, in uh, in queer existence because it was absolutely central. I agree with you uh, that the the the, the, the likelihood of them continuing on and the way they they were really is gone sorry paul i you have a have a comment or question yeah that's okay um actually i go back quite a ways in the gay community in edmonton i no longer live in edmonton uh, my first impression was club 70 and i went there in uh, 1970 after they had just relocated and I was just scared to win there. I mean, there was homosexuals in there. Uh, <laughs> then a handsome man invited me to dance, and I'd never danced with a man before. So, well, it was quite an experience. Anyway, I, to make a long story short, it ended up I was on the board of directors for a number of years at Club 70. And then I ended up being the club manager for the last two years. Huh. And then myself and three others uh, started the roost. 
And I was a full-time manager at the Roost up until 1985 when I sold out to Jim Schaefer. And Michael, uh, I had invited you to my home in St. Albert at the time. Yes. And I, this was 19, uh, 2005. Yep. And I gave you all kinds of information, yep. uh, old club newsletters, uh, all, all kinds of stuff from Club 70. And I said, I'm leaving Edmonton. I'm moving to Nanaimo. But here's all this stuff. I'm sure you'll know what to do with it. So, And then uh, last year, I got a hold of Rob Browatsky and I sent him all kinds of photographs that I had of the roost uh, which I had taken uh, prior to 1985 so there's quite a bit of history that I was luckily able to share. Thanks Paul I, I, I knew I knew your name but I wasn't putting two and two together but now, now that you expressed all this information, I know exactly who you are. <laughs> yeah, I remember you quite well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And, and I just want to comment that, that, Paul, I didn't realize you were back in town. And yes, I, all of that material you gave to me, much of which I looked through myself, which was fascinating. Um, I then took to the City of Edmonton archives as part of the, the gay and lesbian archives there. So all, so I did know what to do with it, <laughs> so to speak. Actually, I'm not back in Edmonton. I'm in Nanaimo. Yeah. And, the, and the pictures that you sent to Rob, uh, Rob does have those, and we're trying to find a way to, to put those online. We also got a massive uh, collection of pictures from Bill Lee, who is on, on, on the call here as well. Uh, and we thank him for those pictures. Uh, you know, having all these pictures, uh, and now we have to try and find a way, a format to present them to the public. Because the pictures that get ended up in, in, the, uh, in the archives, sadly, they, uh, they aren't processing them. Um, you know, there, there is paper files that, uh, that we've gone to, and we went through a number of them trying to come up with a list of pubs. Uh, you know, we went through magazines and looked for looked ads and all kinds of stuff to come up with all those dates and everything. Um, but, you know, uh, 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 Dennis Campbell, who was the owner and editor uh, in chief of uh, Times Point 10 magazine, he donated all his digital files from the magazine, all the magazine copies and all the pictures to the city archives. And so when we went in last year, uh, we asked about them and they said they have not been processed. Now, Dennis donated them back in 2010 or 2011, somewhere around there. And they've been sitting in the basement of the archives for a decade. Uh, and they, they either don't have the staff to process them or just don't want to devote the resources to process them or who knows. So. If you've got influence on our city council, it might be worth influencing some additional cash to go to the city archives to part, start processing all this stuff that they apparently have in their, in their basement that is not available at all. Uh, we, we really found a lack of information when we went researching a lot of the stuff that we did. We are up approaching um, uh, five to 12. So I'm going to ask whether there is any final question or comment from someone. And if I don't see your hand, uh, please just raise your hand. I see Michael's hand. Yes, uh, uh, Rob, and, and thanks again for the information. And I'm really pleased that you um, also put in about um, uh, Darren's play about uh, uh, Trudeau and, and uh, um, the Drake uh, from Vancouver, whose name I already forget. Um, yeah, yeah, who was originally from Alberta, I, I believe as well. Uh, but I also wanted to mention, because that was 1969, that, that, that we many of us talk about that the big event in 1969 was Stonewall. Well, that by Trudeau predates them by a, a six weeks a day. Canada actually made its changes before all of that went on in New York. And we forget that, that, that how important that was in Canada. Uh, it also, I think, uh, indicates that, that much of what changed in Canada was through um, legislation, uh, politics, legal, you know, legal kinds of things that were done where the states had the, you know, they fought and beat him down and the rest of that too. And that. So, so it's a really good reminder of how significant um, things happened in Canada that made the changes and that. So thanks for that as well and as the rest it, of that. It, it's it, a it, good it, point it, at which, sorry, Ron, we, we're, we're really- oh, Sorry. 
uh, at, at the end of the end of the of the time here, and I do want to thank you. So I want to have that opportunity um, to thank you. the The point about Stonewall really is important. In fact, I was out and in Toronto at the time, and Stonewall was uh, yeah, you really didn't pay much attention then. Um, I was just going to mention Ron, that. I really want to thank you for the for the talk you've um, you've given. Really, a lot of information. Um, uh, put through and and thank you for for that. Some of us will remember bits and pieces of it, but to have it all collected in that way is so important. I'd also want to thank uh, um, Don Carter for standing in for Kim, Maureen for our technical help, and uh, hope that we will see you next week when uh, uh, the our speaker will be Richard Boulay, who will speak on. Richard is an artist who will speak on mental health and creativity. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that talk. Uh, I'll ask another further favor of you, if I may, which is that we'll, we'll be sending out an evaluation. Uh, please fill it out, send it back to us, because it really is helpful to us in, uh, in planning future meetings. And uh, also for the, the members of the core people and Ron, if you would like to join us for a brief debriefing uh, after this, uh, simply sign out, which we will do shortly and sign back in. I'm sorry, I'm gonna give you the last word, Ron, since we've still got a couple of minutes, but it's only a couple of minutes. And just to follow up on, on Michael and 19, uh, 1969, uh, that the, the enforcement of, uh, of homosexuals and, and uh, in the crime of, of uh, sodomy and, and uh, indecent assault on a male actually was not entered into the uh, statutes of Canada until 1869. So it was exactly 100 years that we were illegal. Lesbians did not become illegal until 1953. And there you have it. I am, uh, unless there's anything further, I'm going to thank you all for your attendance, remind you again about the evaluation, thank Ron, and uh, turn uh, the uh, uh, meeting back to, to Dawn. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you again to everyone for coming. Thank you, Ron, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Larry, for and thank you, Eric, who is not here for being part of the Aging with Pride team. And Larry, thank you so much for hosting today. Um, and as Kim would say, see y'all next week. <laughs>